to see all your names popping up um, and to see so many, so many familiar names. Um, sorry that I can't be with you in person today. It would be so great to do this all together. Um, thank you for being here today. It's a rainy day here in Chicago, but it's, it's such a great day to come together. Um, and we're looking forward to discussing this critical moment for young people in our city. Today's panel is entitled COVID, the College Enrollment Crisis and Wungle's Bold Solution. As we get started, I wanted to note that this is our first time using Zoom webinars, so please be patient with us, but we have practiced a lot and we hope everything goes smoothly. If you don't know me, my name is Priya Linson. I am the Executive Director of Wungle here in Chicago. If you're not familiar with our work uh, at One Goal, our mission is to close the degree divide in our country. And our vision is that every young person will have an equitable opportunity to achieve their greatest post-secondary aspirations. The way that our model works is that we focus on the three critical years during the transition from high school through the first year of a post-secondary program that you can see here on the slide. That means that we work in close partnership with districts, high schools, and post-secondary institutions to ensure that students are equipped to earn a post-secondary degree or credential. And in Chicago, our program is operating in 60 public and charter schools across the city. Many intervention programs focus their attention on highest performing students, but Wungle focuses specifically on students who are typically in the 2.0 to 3.0 grade point average range. And those students typically have been disproportionately affected by systemic and educational inequities. But those students share the same post-secondary aspirations as their higher performing peers and often lack the resources and support to stay on a post-secondary pathway. So over the past year, I'm sure all of you know that there's been so much effort to ensure that resources are available for students, whether it's basic needs, school support, but the pandemic has only increased the barriers to students accessing those resources. So we saw a need here at One Goal to streamline that information and to aggregate the information so that it's available right at students' fingertips. In a little bit, you'll have a chance to see a sneak peek into the One Goal Summer Hub, which is our innovative solution that connects the Chicago class of 2021 and beyond to knowledge, resources, tools, and relationships that will enable them to take action on their post-secondary plans. We aim to develop this digital solution to help Chicago students that are, Chicago, that are college inclined navigate steps toward enrollment. And you can see a mock-up here on this slide, which is meant to demonstrate what this three-year pilot will incorporate, which is three main components. The first is opt-in texting that provides proactive updates and nudges to prevent summer melt, combined with a chat bot to assist users in navigating the most commonly asked questions. Secondly is the opportunity to access mentorship during this critical transition moment in students' lives. And what you're going to see a glimpse of today by our Managing Director of Program Innovation, Lena Fritz, is the third component, a public website that will serve as a summer resource hub for seniors in Chicago. We're so excited to be working on this project in partnership with both CPS and city colleges and to have received generous support from both the Crown Family Philanthropies and two anonymous foundations. So with that, I'm really excited to introduce our incredible panelists for today. The first is Chief Latanya McNade, McDade, a veteran and accomplished educator. Chief McDade is a Chicago native and a graduate of CPS. In all of her various roles, which include teacher, assistant principal, principal and network chief, she has prioritized instructional equity and excellence for every child. Since assuming the role of chief officer for teaching and learning at CPS in 2016, Chief McDade has challenged the efficacy of traditional education models and initiated the PK to 12 curriculum system project to modernize instructional practices across the district. Secondly, we have here today City Colleges of Chicago Chancellor Juan Salgado, who has focused his 20 year career on improving education and economic opportunities for residents in low income communities. As Chancellor, he oversees Chicago's community college system, serving more than 80,000 students across seven colleges. Chancellor Salgado has been nationally recognized for his work. In 2015, he became a MacArthur Fellow, one of the most prestigious innovation prizes in the United States. 
And lastly, we have Melissa Connolly, the Chief Executive Officer for One Goal. Prior to her service as CEO, Melissa served as One Goal's first Chief Program Officer and led her team in building a program strategy grounded in a deep belief in the brilliance of all students and their communities. As a result, One Goal was one of the first organizations in the college access and success sector to formally approach all programmatic work through the lens of culturally relevant pedagogy. I'm so excited to begin the panel. I'm gonna start with a few prepared questions, um, but if you and the audience have a question, our team is fielding them in the Q&A section of the Zoom, so feel free to chat them in at any point and uh, we'll get to them in uh, shortly. But I'd love to start just by hearing an overview from all of you um, about this problem that we're facing. We know that typically in Chicago, about 31% of students who in the spring intend to enroll in college the next fall do not actually enroll. And we know that in the summer of 2020, that number was even higher due to the pandemic. In your experiences from your various vantage points, what are the top three barriers for the students who intended to enroll but didn't? You want any of us to just jump in? <laughs> just jump in. Go ahead. Okay, I'll I'll jump in. I think um, what I'll start with will come as no surprise. Um, the the financial issues. You know, finances is always a, a huge barrier uh, for our students, even when they receive uh, financial aid. Sometimes it doesn't cover the full cost of tuition or housing or books, um, and that becomes, you know, a huge barrier. So even for a student where their full tuition is paid, uh, just paying for a, a book that might be under $100 um, could potentially be the difference between them, um, you know, following through with enrollment and attending and not. Uh, that, so that's one of the, the biggest barriers. And then what I've seen um, is, you know, family situations that arise. And, and I would say over the course of the past year, you could imagine uh, the, the number of uh, crises that families have experienced that impacts the student's um, ability to, uh, you know, step onto that college campus. I, I remember even pre-pandemic, um, and I'll never forget this because it was heartbreaking, uh, a student who attended a school that I supervised and she was a valedictorian and she graduated with a full four-year scholarship to Howard University. Um, and she had a death in her family and her mom was a single mom and she ended up not going to school and not taking that four-year scholarship to stay at home and, uh, and help her, her mother uh, with her siblings. And um, so, you know, things like that happen. Um, and I just, I just remember the conversations trying to get, you know, work with the family to get her to, to still make it uh, to the university. Um, and then the last thing I would say is the process. The process can be so complicated for students to navigate. Uh, I remember myself on a college, uh, college campus just trying to figure out where the bursar's office is and you know where should I go. Uh, I think about an, another CPS student who um, everything was all set uh, in terms of the financial piece, and a couple of weeks before he was to um, you know get to to school, uh, his mother realized they never submitted the housing documentation so he didn't have a place to stay um you know and and everyone at the school was scrambling to try to figure out um housing so simply you know not understanding which documents to complete when they have to be submitted it can be a very daunting task and uh families need support with that so some you know having uh been in this district for quite some time and you know, working with uh, high schools, we've seen uh, a lot of different situations arise, I think, but the top three were, you know, financial uh, family situations, and then not understanding how to navigate, um, you know, the process. I, I just, uh, I think that uh, what Latina just shared is really right on. Um, I might just add that in this particular environment, all of those factors have gotten exacerbated mm -hmm. to a level that we've just never seen before. And when you think about, in particular, our students at City Colleges, and I was a community college student, I registered one week before the end of the registration deadline. I wasn't quite sure. I spent the whole summer going back and forth and back and forth. Um, and, and that's somewhat what happens with our students. 
right? Um, they're not so sure. And all it takes is one thing that causes a life adjustment. You know, family needs a little bit more money and you need to work, right? And you're able to find work. That's it. You know, you're now the breadwinner or part of the, you know, the income equation that's necessary. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's something that hurts your confidence, you know, in terms of taking that next step. Uh, uh, you know, some concerns, especially in this environment, the health concerns themselves, right? And not just the health concerns for the students, but the health concerns for their families. Our students are living in intergenerational households. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're often in crowded situations, right? Uh, where social distancing and the kind of measures that we've been asked to do are just not as possible. Um, you know, e even when they're, uh, th they're caregivers, <laughs> they help with the children uh, in the family. If they're older children, they're helping with the younger children. My older sister, you know, pretty much helped raise us. <laughs> uh, I was one of, you know, the, the fifth of six, right? And so she's like a second mom. And uh, truth be told, you know, sacrificed her own goals for the rest of us. Right. So I think that these are all things that are happening and they're emotional. They're emotional. Um, and so there's an emotional toll that is taken upon our students as well in just a normal year. And this was, you know, far from that. And what I appreciate about both of your responses is that I think it it challenges this myth that the post-secondary process is easy and linear. <laughs> Uh, it, it's not. Uh, it is, uh, you know, it, it, it requires agility. It requires resilience. And, uh, you know, I, I think we have to acknowledge that it is nonlinear. And, uh, and, and the way in which we can support our students has to be responsive and relational because of the barriers that both Chief McDade and Chancellor Salgado just named. You know, there was a, a really profound moment for me back in August. You know, the Washington Post had just uh, published an article saying that students who were part of families making less than $75,000 were twice as likely to cancel all post-secondary plans. That was accompanied by some recent US Census data that looked at why students weren't enrolling. The number one factor that was reported was financial, which Chief McDade referenced. But I, what I thought was profound and fascinating is that the second highly, most highly named factor was fear. That to me is, is, it should have stopped us all in our tracks because we can do something about fear. Right, there are some places where we just don't have unlimited resources to be able to provide the, the adequate financial support that I, we know our kids need. But fear, we can address as educators, as mentors, as advisors, as supporters of our students. And that felt really actionable. And honestly, it was the first time as the CEO of this organization in this pandemic, where I felt like there was something we could do that was in our locus of control if we could reach our students and help them overcome some of the very real fears that they were facing and taking this leap in their post-secondary journey, that that could be the bridge that helps them ultimately continue their post-secondary operation. Thank you all. You all did such a brilliant job of both talking about data and real experiences that you've seen um, as you've navigated um, and, and really deeply tried to understand what's happening in our landscape. Given that, and especially, Melissa, your last note on the need to be responsive, um, given what we're seeing, what innovative solutions have the three of you seen that have been really successful in supporting students who might be at risk to not persisting? I, I, I might start there. Um, you know, we, and I'll begin with the work that we're doing with Chicago Public Schools through the Chicago Roadmap. Um, a, you know, methodical approach to actually addressing the connections uh, that we, better connections that we need to have as institutions to ensure uh, student success, right, uh, to and through the post-secondary experience. But in particular within the roadmap, you know, we've launched this, you know, student navigators work, very different from an advisor. These are assigned navigators to specific high schools 
uh, to make sure that students that express an interest in uh, coming to city colleges really uh, you know, get the assistance that they need to navigate through the process to make sure that they have a coach along the way that you know they're not going to fall through the cracks um and you know our system is still more clunky than i would want it to be uh and we're working at it but in the meantime uh you know having these navigators is you know a real real benefit uh, and we saw an incredibly uh larger uh, success rate if you will you know we were able to convert uh, over 44% of students, you know, through the navigator effort when, you know, normally we would convert uh, closer to 25% of students, right? Uh, and so that has been really helpful. I think the other thing is to address the financial challenges, we've been providing significant financial incentives uh, between, you know, two and $900 per semester, uh, along with other scholarship opportunities. So this is not star scholarship. This is targeted towards students uh, in sort of different categories uh, and providing them the financial resources that we think they need. And then the other big thing that we've done is, um, you know, just wipe out debt at every moment that we could, right? So we had the Fresh Start Debt Forgiveness Program, which we launched uh, last summer. Uh, we saw 900 students return. But we also used our stimulus dollars to wipe out debt for students that were with us at the moment uh, that you know got to the end of the road and just couldn't pay, right? And so we paid it for them, and we we'll continue to pay it for them. And uh, and so you know I think it's those kinds of things. And I, I say the other thing is we've tried to accelerate you know uh, you know programs that are shorter term that have stackable credentials, recognizing that some students uh, journeys may have to adjust right and so getting them some education now that gets them into the marketplace but then they can come back and finish mm -hmm. later or uh, continue on part-time uh, is i think a really important thing to do and a really important thing to message right that uh that's not just okay it's uh it, it, it could be a much better path for our students and so those are some of the things we think um, are working uh, best right now. One thing I can add just, uh, you know, I, I think anybody who is uh, a advocate for post-secondary college access and success work or just social justice work more broadly is probably familiar with the work of Georgia State University. Uh, they now graduate more Black students than any HBCU in the country, uh, have virtually closed the degree divide between their white students and their Black students, have done some just phenomenal groundbreaking work. Uh, and Dr. Tim Reddick, who has been on the leading edge of that work, uh, is a One Goal Atlanta board member. And so I get the opportunity to work pretty closely with him. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that's fascinating is the story that gets told about Georgia State often is, you know, this sexy story about AI and about, you know, all of the, the analytics that they leverage. Uh, and there was a, a story that he shared with me that uh, actually, I think for me, unlocked where there's real opportunity in, in student success space more broadly. Uh, he said, you know, what most people don't realize is that when he started his equity initiatives, he, the first investment he made, the very first investment was purchasing a, two screens for every counselor. And, and, you know, he's like, when I share that story, people think that that's so silly. Oh, everybody has a double monitor. You know, what impact does that have on student success? But he said, the reason why I did it was because counselors always had the information about what students needed, where there was an issue with their account, where, there were, where they were falling behind on their credits. And what we never realized was that students didn't have that same ac access. The information wasn't in their hands. It was in the hands of our educators. And so he said, I brought two screens so that every time a counselor was looking at information, the student had access to the same information. And what we have realized based on that example and others is that there is a real need to democratize information about the college access and success process. We need to put the information in the hands of our kids. We talk about empowering students all the time, putting them at the wheel. But the reality is a lot of our systems and structures and processes don't do that. There are barriers to them accessing information, whether it's because they don't have access to technology 
or it's because the the systems that we've built just aren't user friendly, aren't truly in in their the palm of their hand, i.e., on their phones. Uh, and so I think there is, is a broader movement in this space and certainly at one goal to figure out how we can democratize this process so that there's no delay, no lag, no barrier to kids getting the information that they need and desire. And, and I would just um, kind of add on to what you both have said um, coming from uh, the school district angle is that the work, uh, the post-secondary work begins before students uh, receive the diploma on the stage. And so when some of the things that we've done beyond the unprecedented partnership that we have with, uh, with city colleges, which has really helped us to bridge the gap between um, the school district and um, you know, college life, so, you know, we work really closely with the navigators that, that Juan talked about, and that has been a game changer. But even beyond that, you know, positioning students for success before they get to uh, their first year of college. So we have a, a historic, a landmark policy, learn, plan, succeed, where we ensure that every single student graduates with a concrete post-secondary plan in their back pocket. So to your point, um, Melissa, about you know, students having the kind of knowledge to really be empowered and have agency and ownership over their learning goals and their future, um, learn, plan, succeed is established to do just that. I would say Say the other thing is, if we know that uh, financial um, issues are the number one, is the number one barrier uh, for students being able to get to and through college, how can we as a school district position them to be ahead of the game before they get there? And so we have made a uh, double down on our efforts to ensure that every CPS student graduates with at least one early college credential in their back pocket. So we've expanded advanced placement coursework, IB coursework, our partnership with City College, Colleges. We've expanded uh, dual credit and dual enrollment uh, CTE credentials so that students are graduating ahead of the curve. So you think about us, we, we highlighted a few students from Sarah Good who graduated from high school with upwards of 15 earned college credits in their back pocket. Um, so think about the, the financial barriers that were removed from that alone um, and then being positioned for success to even finish college early. So those are some of the things that we have put in place um, to set students up for success long before we hand off the diploma um, on the stage. It's so exciting to hear about all of the work that you're leading and the, um, the ability for students to really own their own journeys. Um, and that, that's really what, what this is about. And, this is a, 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 and it's about coming together as organizations to ensure that there's a seamless transfer. And so I, I just love to hear from all of you. Um, first, what, what, what could this summer hub a collaboration accomplish that each of us might not be able to do on our own? I, I just say, you know, to, to start off, I think, this is the moment for us to innovate and for us to create and for us to respond, right? And, you know, I think the first thing to mark is that, you know, we're, you know, by coming together, we are doing our best to meet the moment, right? In that regard. Uh, but uh, to me, the, it, yeah, yeah, you got to have the tech tools, but you really got to have the innovation and relationships and processes and handoffs. And it comes back down to uh, a student who's a human being, you know, in an environment, right? And so the AI can help with that. Our tech tools can help with that. But it is really, it is really the heart and soul of, you know, why an educator is an educator at Chicago Public Schools? Why Chief McDade is who she is and why Melissa Conley is who she is and their journeys and seeing their journeys in our students and trying to figure out how do you create the right kind of system. And I think we're at that moment of frustration with what is. There's enough collective dissatisfaction, right? That I think we have an opportunity to truly move forth. And I don't think this summer 
will, will, will solve all without question, but it will put us on the journey, right? Um, and I think getting on the journey is something to celebrate. And I certainly wanna you know, thank One Goal and its leadership for you know, making sure that we accelerate uh, that pathway towards that journey. Um, I, just to add on to pile on to that, because uh, everything that you said resonates with me as well. You know, I continue to say, um, and I think this is a, a, a theme that's being reverberated throughout the country. We are in an educational crisis right now. Um, and, and, you know, the pandemic has brought to bear um, sobering inequities that exist for our young people. And so now more than ever before, we have to acknowledge that um, as, a, as a school district, we cannot do this work alone. It is going to take all, all hands on deck, everyone working together, not just in a spirit of collaboration, but in convergence. How do we bring our work streams together, our, uh, our resources, resources together, our tools together, and our expertise to really wrap our arms around our young people and support them through this time? Um, and so when I think about, when I listen to um, everything that uh, you know, Juan talked about that's happening at CCC, knowing that what we're doing and understanding the need to have external partners um, like Wongo, you know, every every turn our student makes, there's some there's there's someone there. There's a stopgap to make sure that um, we don't lose one, um, and so that's why it's critically important. I think yes, even if at the school level, at the district level, we did everything that we could, you know, having a partnership like what we have with One Goal and City Colleges, it makes all the difference because once our students, it's, it's unrealistic to think that the school district is going to really be able to expand the reach um, into that first or second year without the kind of support that we receive from One Goal, without knowing we've got a partnership with City Colleges and there's a navigator there, uh, there's someone there that understands the needs of Chicago public school students and is ready to step up and support. And so when you think about, you know, that that three way process where all agencies are talking together to support a student, um, it really significantly increases their chances and opportunities to persist towards obtaining uh, the degree, experiencing economic mobility, and, and really acquiring rewarding, rewarding careers. Um, so, you know, we have to come together um, as a community to support each and every one of our students. And, and that's why I think it's important. I, I do wanna just really uh, quickly as a point of personal <laughs> privilege, just kind of say, um, I this is, um, it's not lost on me, all of the work that we've done um, that I've been championing, uh, championing as uh, the chief education officer, I, I want to make it clear that in Chicago public schools, the work that we're doing is our vision and our core values. It doesn't lie in the hands of one sole individual. So although um, I will be transitioning from the district at the end of the school year, um, the, the legacy of the work that we've been doing is, is, uh, is concrete. And um, it is the work that, that will be found in our five-year vision. It's the work that we have codified in policy, because as a district, we know that, you know, if, if I'm gone, and the policy remains. And it is what we believe at our core is right for our students. And so we've put sustainable plaque practices in place like the roadmap, like Learn, Play, and Succeed to continue this work in our partnership uh, with one goal because this is the right work to realize our mission and vision for this organization as an educational institution. So I just wanna make that clear um, that this is about the core values of our district and what we believe is right for every single student that we serve. I think I'll just add two quick notes um, and I know the questions are starting to come in, um, so I will be cautious of my airtime. Um, I think the, the first thing that I just wanted to name is, you know, I think what we all are bringing to the table as, as leaders of color, as, uh, you know, many of us, first generation college graduates ourselves, is humility. I think we all recognize now more than ever, we can't do this alone. We actually can't afford to operate on islands. Uh, the, the problem is too complex and too deep and, and wide for us to tackle as individual institutions. Uh, you know, and the reality is our kids don't 
experience CPS and CCC and one goal, right? This is all just a part of the, the, the year of being a 17 year old and an 18 year old. And so if we don't work together, it, does, it doesn't even make sense to them. And so I think really at the foundation of why we needed to come together, why now was honestly just a shared value of, of humility and recognizing that we can't afford to do it alone. Uh, I think the other thing that you know I've been reflecting a lot about, we recently did a landscape analysis where we interviewed 46 stakeholders, uh, most of whom were are local in Chicago, uh, former partners, educators, uh, principals, district leaders, and we said, what is it about one goal? What, what do you think we are bringing to the table? Hold up a mirror for us so we know where to lean in. And the, the, the broadest theme that we consistently heard from the, the folks who we've been working with for 14 years was flexibility. What we appreciate about one goal is that you're willing to flex. You're listening to our needs and you're willing to not just, you know, say this is the standard model and this is only what we offer, but actually meet us wherever we are because you, you respect and honor that we know what's best for our kids. Uh, and it was just, it was so beautiful to have that reflected back. And for me, it was even more of a reason why we needed to approach Chief McDade and, and Chancellor Salgado and basically say, how can we help? What role can we play? We have some ideas, but we really want to meet you where you are. We get that we are a nonprofit that is, you know, still relatively small and that gives us agility. It allows us to work outside some, you know, bureaucratic barriers that I know are really challenging for broad institutions. And, and so I think really it is what we are each bringing to the table that makes this partnership so unique and, and so high potential. Thank you, all three of you. I'm going to pause for one second and remind the audience that you can ask questions in the Q&A and we're going to get to all of your questions in just a minute. Before we get there, um, Chief McDade, I would be remiss if we didn't pause and recognize the incredible amount of vision that you have contributed to this district and um, for, for decades and um, your fingerprints are all over this district and the city and how much you will be missed um, and the the leadership that you will um, you will be uh, the stuff that you're taking and, and what you're going to bring to, to your new district and um, everything that you shared about uh, CPS's vision and the work living on um, really resonates and, and I'm sure many people in the audience had questions about that and I'm so glad you you shared that I um, I would love to hear from you specifically first and then from others um, given the vision that you've helped craft and, and the, the need for these kinds of partnerships, what else is needed to scale the kind of innovative solutions that we're talking about here today? Well, I think, I mean, I think we're, we're off to that start, right? The fact that one goal is, um, is, is doing the summer bridge and expanding access to uh, resources to students uh, across all of our schools. I think that that right there says a lot about um, bringing innovative practice to bear at scale. Um, and, and that's what we needed uh, when we talked earlier, um, when this was first just kind of a thought of uh, idea, um, I was so excited because you know, I was feeling the pressure of like, how do we looking at the data, you know, it, it, it's sobering data, it's alarming. Um, and you start to wonder, you know, we have um, partnerships with one goal, but that access was limited to, you know, it wasn't at scale. So when I heard about Summer Bridge, I was like, this is perfect innovation at the time when we need it the most. Um, so I'm really excited about that. I think expanding the work that we're doing um, with city colleges through our Chicago roadmap, which is underway. Um, a lot of that work is advancing and taking root. I think that is going to be a game changer um, in the post-secondary space uh, and has brought, there's a lot of innov innovative practice coming out of um, the Chicago roadmap. So I'm excited about that. Um, and then we just launched our, our high school strategy as well. So we've, we've got some pretty big initiatives uh, coming out of Chicago Public Schools to really double down on um, the goals that we have established within our vision to ensure that every student um, is having access to the kinds of experiences that are preparing them to succeed in college um, and in life. Uh, Pia, if you don't mind, I would just love to add one thing is um, we have a president 
and a first lady that know community college students real well, okay? Um, and uh, are, I believe, prepared to support them in ways that we have seen in Chicago. We've been leading in the area of free college through Chicago Star Scholarship. And what we know through Star Scholarship is when you provide students that level of financial support, especially those students for whom that level of support is absolutely necessary and the game changer for them to even choose post-secondary education, right? To persist through post-secondary education, graduation rates climb um, tremendously and students' lives are improved tremendously. And so I would just add that, you know, the compliment to the local work that we're doing uh, the, the biggest compliment would be a federal investment in free community college, um, you know, for students. And we have that opportunity before us right now. We may not get that opportunity again in a long time. Melissa, anything that you want to add about scaling or sustaining innovative solutions? I mean, I would uh, echo, underscore the the moment in time. I saw there was a question uh, in the Q and A about you know state level as well, um, and I think state level advocacy for funding solutions for our students is really what we need. I mean, I will say that as a practitioner, there's there's lots of the work that we feel really equipped to solve for. You know, I, I mentioned earlier when students are navigating fear, we have we have the capacity, the experience as educators to meet students where they are, to leverage a culturally responsive lens, to a relational approach. Uh, but when the rubber hits the road on a an, a, the student's account and they just have to pay the bill, there's only so much we can do. Resources are incredibly strapped, and so you know, I would love to see at the federal level in the way that Juan described uh, real shifts in uh, college affordability. Uh, but I also think that there's work that we could be doing at the state level to ensure that community colleges are getting the funding that they need to adequately support students. You just heard Chancellor Salgado describe like what they're doing with those funds when they're doing clearing student debt accounts. Like I can't but help go back to when I was 19 and that $500 on my bill made me drop out and go wait tables for another semester until I could re-enroll at Morton College in Cicero. Like that would have been so liberating, so freeing to have that nominal amount of money cleared from my account. And the reality is, you know, Chancellor Salgado can't do that alone. Uh, he needs state and federal policies that actually enable them to do that kind of work in the long term. Thanks, Melissa, for turning to this first question that came from the audience Q&A, and I'd love to hear um, both Latanya and Juan share your perspectives on what supports from the state level you see as being most helpful or could be most helpful to the work that you're planning this summer. Well, I'm always going to say finances, you know, uh, financial support, it, uh, that not just in a pandemic, that's always been, um, you know, a problem. Uh, so I would I would have to say, you know, more financial support for our students, um, ensuring that, you know, they have what they need to be able to to make it to and through college, even when, um, you know, some students uh, have uh, get access to funding for um, tuition. I talked about earlier, they need additional dollars for, um, you know, room and board books, et cetera. So funding is always going to be the name of the game when it comes to our students being able to access uh, post-secondary education. I, I, I just, you know, Chief McDade needs resources. K through 12 institutions need resources. We fought for a more equitable funding formula because we understood that that's the base for student success to Chief McDade's point earlier in post-secondary. It starts earlier, mm -hmm. right? And um, a well-resourced K through 12 system. I'm in higher ed, right? Um, and it, they shouldn't make us choose between early education and K through 12 and higher ed. You know, uh, you know it, it, what I'm expressing is that the base here is 
a K through 12 system that's well funded. Having said that, you know, we need equity based funding everywhere, okay, especially in higher ed, okay. Um, and let me tell you one bill that's you know out there, uh, which is the MAP set aside. It's a very simple thing, right? Community college students apply later on for financial aid. By the time they apply, it's too late. It's all been taken up. The analogy is you put all the food on the table for your children, and there's one child that arrives late to the dinner table. And you're okay with that child not having anything to eat, especially it's the least nourished child throughout their entire life, okay? And we continue to just put the, without a set aside. And what we're saying in community college is set aside 15% of the total MAP dollars so that these children could get some nourishment. And the answer so far, because we don't like equity in higher education. We like status quo. <laughs> the answer so far is not so much. Not even the head of Isaac supports it. Uh, I tell you, that kind of thinking is going to change. We're going to work to make sure it changes. The equity victories in K through 12 will become equity victories in higher education. That's what we need at the state level. Investment in what we've already won in K through 12, equity funding and equity focus in higher ed. Thank you so much, Juan. Um, that resonates deeply um, and certainly certainly connects to how, how we're thinking about uh, how we're thinking about building up Summer Hub as well. Um, next question from another audience member. Um, one barrier we routinely see in our work of summer transition is students just having a hard time navigating student portals and the confusing nature of post-secondary planning in general. Sometimes just having someone to speak to and show them how to do this is critical. How will Summer Hub offer critical human support given our remote circumstances? I'm gonna start from a Wungle perspective and share that you're going to see a little bit of a glimpse of this when um, Lena jumps in with her demo. Um, and you're so right, the human factor cannot be um, cannot be ignored. And it's why working in partnership is so critical. Um, and we are really examining how we can work in partnership, for example, with City College's current navigator system um, that will allow us to sort of seamlessly transition information and students to the right person um, on the right campuses. And um, I'm curious if anyone else has thoughts about this question and what, what we need to be thinking about as we continue to build out Summer Hub. I think I'll just go back to the, the statement that I made earlier about convergence, right? And I love the way Melissa said, you know, a 17 year old doesn't, they don't really care that CPS is doing this, one goes doing this and CCC is doing this. They just, they just want to know that they're getting what they need and they're getting it in a way that doesn't bring about uh, additional frustration and, and fear when at a time where they're already anxious. Um, so I think that that whole piece around convergence is necessary um, and critical so that, you know, um, the work is seen as collective um, and the conversations that are being had uh, on the CPS side in in high schools with counselors with students um, is about, you know, that navigation understanding that these tools are going to exist and you'll have support with this. Um, so that we're all speaking the same language and um, you know students aren't hearing something different when they're talking to uh, a navigator and something different when they're talking to a counselor or or, or uh, someone um, with one goal. So I think just making sure that we are all uh, working towards the same North Star and making sure our students, we're, the communication, uh, we're speaking with one voice and preparing them for what's to come. I think the only thing I would add is, you know, and this is a, a word of caution to us uh, as leaders of this initiative and this work. I do think in the, you know, education tech space, there is a uh, implicit uh, theory that if you build it, they will come. And I think we've learned that's not always true. Uh, and 
uh, you know, often you can build something incredible, incredible, but that doesn't mean students know about it. It doesn't mean that students have what they need to access it. And, and so where, where we really want to win at this initiative is not just not just building the resource up, not just making these things a little bit more user friendly and accessible, but actually doing the work to, to bring students to the resources. Right, like it is not just you build it and hope that folks show up. You actually have to do the outreach. You actually have to work with educators, parents, students, help make them aware of what does exist. And so I think that work often, you know, isn't what people lead with. It isn't the, you know, because it requires us to roll up our sleeves and, and get out into communities. And, and it, but that to me is really actually the like heart of this work and ultimately what will make or break our success here. Last question that we have from the audience, although we can we can certainly take a few more, um, is uh, directed to you, Chief McDade. Considering this crisis and colleges and universities sending award letters at a much later time this year, will Learn Plan succeed deadline be will the Learn Plan succeed deadline be extended for our class of 2021? So we typically, you know, as the data comes in, we make determinations about extending deadlines based on um, the current state. So uh, that def that uh, actually can um, most certainly happen. Um, so, you know, as we start to collect more data in, in terms of where students are with having their concrete post-secondary plans and taking into consideration there will be delays, that does impact our timeline for sure. Thanks so much. Um, as we wrap up, last question um, that we have here, what's one thing that you want folks to leave this conversation with? I'd love to hear from each person. I think I would just reiterate the statement that I made earlier about uh, understanding that um, the, the P-12 educational system can't do this work alone. Um, it is an entire ecosystem that surrounds our students and every, every um, agency and every partner plays a role. Um, and so uh, everyone should take an all hands on, uh, uh, on deck approach and know that in Chicago public schools, we welcome um, partnering um, to get the job done. I would say that the the, the, the challenge of summer melt is eminently solvable. Uh, and uh, we do it through the level of convergence, as Chief McDade has said. Uh, but we also do it by widening our perspective on post secondary education, by widening our perspective on student success and pathways to student success, and by ensuring that at every turn, that widening of our perspective is felt by our students. No student should feel less than for choosing a specific career that they're passionate about. No student should feel less than by choosing a community college path versus a traditional four-year path. And we just have to ensure that as we're working on summer melt, we're doing it with that open, expansive, um, you know, opportunity sets that exist for people, local communities, um, and society. And it's funny, right, when we jumped on the call and we were just sort of quickly and informally catching up, uh, Chief McDade and I almost at the same time said now more than ever. Uh, and it's probably the phrase I say, uh, you know, multiple times a day, I wake up thinking about it, go to sleep thinking about it now more than ever. Uh, and, you know, I know that that could feel cliche, uh, but I, I think what I, you know, it's, I'm, I'm married to a firefighter uh, and that being married to a first responder often informs how I think about uh, education and my job and my role. And one thing that I have seen is, you know, after a disaster, uh, there's a lot of energy, a lot of care, a lot of commitment to support whoever the, the victim was or those experiencing the crisis. So, you know, think back to Katrina and, you know, the fire service showed up and hundreds of thousands of folks from across the country poured into New Orleans. Uh, and then they left. And 
the real recovery process doesn't happen in the first five days or often even six months after a crisis. It, it's years later, two years, three years later that really our kids and our communities are, are most in need of continued support and investment. And my biggest fear is that there's a lot of energy and momentum sort of to get kids back to school and then we're gonna lose it. And folks aren't gonna actually give the same attention, energy, love, investment and care to our kids when they actually need it most. We are showing up with an innovative solution in this moment as partners, but really this is not something that we are seeing as a one-time pandemic response. This is something I am hopeful that we can actually establish as just part of the way we do the work for years and years to come and a true commitment to see our kids through this entire recovery, which won't happen in a night, it won't happen in a year, but really um, will, will require a much deeper and broader commitment from all of our stakeholders. Thank you so much for that beautiful wrap up. And Chief McDade, Chancellor Salgado, Melissa, thank you for all of your thoughtful responses to our questions. Um, we definitely know how busy you are and appreciate so much uh, you joining us today. Um, and with that, we're closing our panel and going to move on to the demo. Thank you so much for, for being here, all three of you. Um, thank you for Austin, having me. Thank, thank you. you. Audience, I'm so excited to introduce now Lena Fritz, our Managing Director of Program Innovation for One Goal Chicago, who is going to show us a behind the scenes preview of this pilot. Lena, I think you're on mute. Oh, thank you, sorry. <laughs> Uh, thanks so much, Priya. As, as mentioned, uh, my name is Lena Jean Fritz. I'm the Managing Director of Program Innovation uh, for One Goal Chicago. And I'm just so thrilled to be spearheading this work for students working with CPS and our post-secondary um, partners, funders, educators across the city to really create something that has the potential uh, to make a lasting impact on college enrollment rates for high school seniors across the city, especially right now in this moment. And just listening to the brilliance of our distinguished guests, I mean, I just have to say, the spirit inside me leapt with resonance as I heard you all speaking about financial barriers and um, the need to work together. And that is the idea that I want to make clear is that we're not trying to add a fancy new product to the landscape that's gonna create more like information fatigue for our students. This is truly about equity of access to the existing knowledge, resources, relationships, and, and that, that we as a, uh, as a community, right, uh, have available to students and and it's about connecting students to those existing resources and relationships when they need it uh, the most so we're not trying to reinvent the wheel like we're not trying to be all things for all people we know how hard our city has already been working on the secondary side the post-secondary side and we want this website to be simply a tool that will empower all of us, all of those working in this space to truly lock arms and create a stronger, more coherent citywide strategy in a way that centers the student experience. The ultimate goal of this website, again, is to connect graduating seniors in Chicago, all graduating seniors, uh, to the current knowledge, resources, and relationships that can help our young people take action on their post-secondary plan. So with that being said, I'm so excited to share my screen and to give you a preview of our work thus far with the disclaimer that we are working round the clock right now. This is still in process. I'm sharing a staging site. So it's, it's, it's a demo and it is changing every day. But I, I still think it's worth sharing a little sneak peek with you all of uh, where we're at. Okay, here we go. Right. So this is the uh, homepage 
for um, the, the site that we are building called One Goal Summer Hub, Chicago edition. And truly uh, the user of the site, so our students, uh, all of this is, is in service to them. We are designing this with students and, and guides in mind. We've been talking around the clock with uh, for the past like month with, with many different stakeholders uh, who are most proximate to students. We want students to feel comfortable turning to this website for post-secondary needs the same way that maybe they're turning to Google. Uh, we're hoping to accomplish three key things through this site. And the three components that we're hoping to ensure a baseline level of access and support is, first of all, um, the chat experience. So we're really excited to be partnering with Admit Hub. Uh, they are the original um, chat chatbot provider for GSU when GSU did their initial um, RCT. And we've been um, learning about the just the work that they've been doing for the past uh, five years. And we're really hoping to use the chatbot as a way to curate uh, the information to and deliver it to students when they need it, when they ask for it. And so as you can see, this uh, little chatbot, uh, it is not populated yet, but this is just a just an example of um, it being accessible straight on the website. If if a student doesn't want to browse, they can simply type in a question, and um, we're going to make the uh, the the chatbot connect the the resources to the student um, based on their question. Another uh, aspect of this site is our personalized plan. And so it's the idea that a student with a simple uh, couple of filters would be able to do a um, search and filter by a set of institutions, or they could search by their counselors um, or their high school to, and, and that is one way we're trying to like connect students to, the, um, the resources that are available and the people that are, that are standing, um, waiting, waiting for, uh, to support them. This personalized plan starts with applications, you know, so, so students can kind of look uh, at an institution like National Lewis, for example, and they can see, is it, is it do I still um, have time to, to go and fill out an application here? Um, it kind of brings everything into one location. So if, if a student um, hasn't filled out a FAFSA, NLU's code is right here. Um, if a student is through their um, application step, which mo most of uh, students coming um, to the website most likely will be, it, it, they will have an enrollment checklist. And so uh, each of these has a little little cursor that you can click to a checkbox to to kind of give that feeling of like accomplishment you know I, I got that done set up my student portal um, and all of these things will link to a personalized um, link that that redirects students directly back to the NLU website um, after students have walked through all of the key enrollment steps they could um, click on resources, which is really about um, kind of tying up those loose ends. So final preparations for day one, logistics, transportation, trying to figure things out, um, updating their high school counselor, like circle back with your high school uh, and update them on any plans that you have, uh, know your, your campus contact. So want to make sure that um, students know exactly who they need to contact um, in the admissions office or whoever is that point person. And we also want to always remind students like, these are the programs that are the high quality support programs that are available at this institution that you should definitely explore. For example, like 1 million degrees, right? Like they're, um, they have a, an amazing program with the CCCs. 
uh, we're, we're not trying to like be duplicative. Like we want to funnel students to those existing programs that, that already are in, in play. I also wanted to show you that ultimately um, students will get to like find the specific areas based on um, where they are uh, in their enrollment process. So uh, this is the time to enroll page. They can go to four year or two year. There's, a, there's kind of like a too long didn't read section and a compilation of links and tools. But if students, right, because of the pandemic and everything that has been going on, if, if they haven't actually uh, made their, their plans and firmed them up yet, it's okay, like we want to show students that like wherever you are in your pathway, like there, there's still opportunity for you to make some moves. And so we wanted to also address those students who may still be undecided. And like Chief McDade had mentioned earlier, right? And everyone really like financial barriers are, are such a um, huge part of, uh, whether or not students get access to the resources that they need to be able to complete their degrees. And so we wanted to make sure that whatever curriculum and information that we've built for the past 10 years, right? Like we wanna be able to give that, um, that knowledge and that insights and, and share it with, with all students and, and not just students who like the 25 that were in the program, in the one goal program um, at each high school. So we've broken it down to like paying tuition, paying bills, and it takes students through everything from budgeting and uh, like connecting to uh, programs that help with food insecurity to like, uh, how do I like get ready to go? Um, where is there um, existing resources in the landscape? For example, uh, there's a citywide lottery for laptops. Uh, do students know about that? We will have a link directly to CompuDopt. Um, M Relief, uh, a, a partner that oh, we're working with to really expedite the process of applications for, for SNAP benefits. Uh, those are all just existing resources that we want to basically create like a one-stop shop where students can, can go to find them and, and um, apply. And also here, we wanted to have like, again, a quick and easy way for students to, to figure out like, like maybe I lost my information for, for who is my, my person who's in my corner and wanted to make sure that students never felt alone, that they know exactly who's in their corner, how to get in contact with them. Um, and this is the mobile friendly version. So you, know, you can see that uh, this, will, this is what it would look on um, a phone because we know that like 90% of our students are, are scrolling through their phones on, on most um, situations. And so, yeah, we, we have, um, again, the uh, personalized plan experience, the chatbot experience, and uh, an opportunity to opt in to a, a, a texting campaign. And so we will be sending, uh, sending nudges throughout the summer um, to, to any Lena, student who opts in. Lena, you're getting, you're getting some questions in the Q&A. Um, and I'm wondering if you can answer the question, how can students find out about the hub? Yes, um, great question. So we are working in lockstep with the Office of School Counseling and Post-Secondary um, Advisors. So the, uh, the, the CPS unit, right? So Dr. Truex and, and Michelle Howard, who is leading on the summer transition plan for CPS. Uh, it, it's been amazing to, to work with such passionate leaders because they've they've really brought us in at their ground floor of the summer transition planning that that they are launching. Um, just yesterday, we went to a focus group where we were able to really just sit in and listen to what guide, guidance counselors and and different um, post secondary transition coordinators and team members from last year uh, 
experience the the summer support that they that they provided and and gave feedback on like what what were the barriers what 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 what's on our wish list uh, what went really well what really worked and we're taking all of that rich wisdom that is being shared and and think in thinking about how can we apply that uh, within this context how do we apply it so that we can use the site to try to solve for some of those pain points and and really use it use this site as a way to centralize information and then redirect students back to um, the the institutions that are either sending them off with loving hands or or, or extending their arms to uh, to receive them from the post-secondary end. Lena, can I jump in there? Sure. Um, the other thing I would add, some of the best advice we got as we were uh, building this collaboration was to connect with as many stakeholders as we could. And, uh, you know, in addition to CPS and city colleges have also had some very early conversations with the mayor's office as well. Uh, you all likely have heard of My Shy, My Future, uh, you know, a, an opportunity to connect youth to opportunities across this, the city. And so we're looking for other platforms and sort of existing opportunities where students are are already to share some of this information directly with students um, and other stakeholders. And so really, I think there's uh, an opportunity for us as we continue this work to identify where are students already going? And then how do we make sure that this information is available to them where they are, whether it's My Shy My Future or other spaces. Um, I will also say it's part of the reason why we're having this panel, uh, you know, bringing in, a, you know, nearly 100 participants into what this is, uh, because we really do believe that there could be a reverberating factor that uh, also just makes this work much more uh, public. Uh, and uh, I think the more folks who are in the know, the more likely we are going to be to get students in the know as well. We have another question that's also come in from the chat. Um, it is, is this a tool for students from the class of 2021 that have yet to apply to college or students that have applied and need assistance transitioning or both? Yes, it is both. Um, our, our first, uh, like our first focus is time to enroll because that we, we know that the summer is, uh, can be a black hole, right? we're chasing students, we're getting blocked by students or on the phone. Like we, we wanna be able to make sure that students have access to this information that we're not serving as gatekeepers that are, that's like feeding students the, the checklist. Like we want students to have that level of um, agency and independence and access so that they can say, okay, wait, what are my enrollment steps? Um, oh yes, I remember um, before I graduated, you know, I got, uh, I got this link right to, to, from my from my high school, and and I signed up for this this service. And we'll be sending those if they signed up for the service. We'll be sending those nudges that will redirect them to um, the checklist. And that checklist they'll be able to access on the site. They'll be able to download as a PDF or uh, you know onto their onto their um, devices and. They'll, that will be populated again with links to um, back to the website with, with additional resources. But we also wanted to make sure that students who were undecided didn't feel like all is lost, right? Like our students have very nonlinear pathways sometimes and um, we wanna be able to meet them where they're at. And so we didn't feel like it would be right to only purely focus on time to enroll when so many students uh, have have had some delays in their in their planning. And as we wrap this session, we have one more question that came in through the chat, um, which is, is the framework of Summer Hub replicable for other school districts? How can we get this in Detroit and Metro Detroit? Do you want to start that, Lena? Well, um, I think it's it's we're we're designing this in a way that is replicable and um, scalable because we're we're leveraging that technology to um, enhance the power 
of human connection. And we know that the connections are already existing and, and the relationships are already there. And really, this is just a coordination tool to bring strategic coherence to you so that we can all speak with one voice. What we're doing this year is starting small. You know, we can't put every single institution into here. We're starting with like 40 uh, schools that uh, on the to and through website um, have have shown us that like these are the highest enrollment schools where where Chicago graduates tend to matriculate. So we're, we're kind of focusing in on those schools and making sure that our database is robust um, and personalized. And we're staffing our, our team to have a website content team that's going to be regularly updating and scraping websites and, and getting updated information um, and developing new content based on how students are interacting. And then we're also standing up a texting um, team, a texting support team, ideally staffed by near peers and, uh, and alumni uh, who, are, who are the most proximate to the student experience. And I would, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, just quickly plug some of our national efforts uh, that are happening alongside of this local effort. So um, yes to everything that, that Lena described, we do think it's really important to uh, take a pilot approach so that we can innovate and learn what works, what doesn't to do this ultimately in the most efficient, sustainable and effective way in the long term. Um, and so we are cautious of stretching ourselves too thin too early because we really wanna get this right for, for our kids. Um, and please know that you know, one goal right now serves uh, six regional sites and then three additional districts where we're really asking ourselves some hard questions about what, what could it look like for us to provide the, the tools, resources, support for post-secondary advising and ultimately matriculation to a post-secondary pathway to any district across the country based on their unique needs, uh, their unique assets, uh, and, and a lot of that work, you know, we started innovating on over the last year and, and it really I think the pandemic has just accelerated the need for that innovation. And so we have a team of folks who is receiving calls from districts all across the country every day and really starting partnership conversations about what could a partnership with one goal look like. And so if you do know a district, whether it's Detroit or otherwise that would be interested in building a collaborative partnership, please know that we are actively building the pipeline to do this kind of work with many other districts across the country. Thanks so much for the demo um, and uh, for all the questions uh, that folks asked. Uh, we're going to transition um, and pass the mic over to Wungle Chicago board member Jessica Sieja. Jessica is a a uh, member of our Chicago board and who's directly supporting the Summer Hub, both the build out and serving as a key advisor uh, to our program innovation team. Jessica, welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, I am Jessica Seja, a very new and very excited member of One Goals Chicago Regional Board. Uh, I just want to take the time to thank everybody for your wonderful insight. Um, this is why I'm such a proud supporter of One Goal. It's because of your innovative approach to constantly meeting students where they are. Um, you take calculated risks, track key metrics, and you hold yourselves accountable, frankly, better than some for-profit companies that I know. So I'm thrilled to support this opportunity because it leverages technology to cast a wider net to help all students. Um, I also wanted to speak to you guys today on what makes this solution possible and some different ways that you can help. As Lena just demonstrated, this is no small feat. This is why we refer to this as a bold solution. This, is, this effort is bigger than anything that one goal can do on their own. So it's an opportunity to meet more students than ever before. And if we're successful, we will have a scalable solution to reach all CPS graduating seniors at a critical time when they take their first steps towards a post-secondary pathway. So in order to reach this far and wide, it's going to take a collaborative effort. One goal is working closely with educational institutions and philanthropists across Chicago. So we see this as a shared goal across the city. And there's many ways for anyone to help. So if you're an educator, you can help us get the word out as this is something students have to opt into. Um, if you're in marketing or technology, you can help out Lena's team. Just don't be shy. Um, I did want to call out some specific ways, some of the more broad-based ways that one can support. 
Um, one would be sharing our program with anybody you know that can benefit from it. And so this is especially for those who work with students or families. Um, if you work with anybody in this field or any, any, anybody relevant to the field that we're working in, um, please continue to engage with One Goal as we roll out this effort. Um, you can also join me in donating to this work, specifically to this bold solution, or you can donate to the emergency fund to meet some of One Goal's fellow's basic needs. Um, you can also support One Goal's generating general operating fund, which will allow them to continue doing their proven work throughout the city. So thank you everybody for attending today. Um, I just do wanna turn it back to Priya for some closing comments. Thank you so much for those inspiring words, Jessica, and for being here today. And thanks also to Chancellor Salgado, Chief McDade, Melissa Connolly, and Lena Fritz as well. It's been so great everybody having you here with us as we announced this pilot and celebrate the incredible partnerships that we've built across Chicago. If you want to learn more about One Goal Summer Hub, or if you want to discuss making an investment in our work, please reach out to us. We would love to talk more. Thanks so much and have a great rest of your day, everybody.